I'm an educated woman and an educator. I believe freedom can be found in the human imagination and that to know how society is doing, we have to ask how our school children are doing. I believe in girls and I'm here today to tell you about a school that I think is presenting an exciting new model on how to effectively educate girls in extreme poverty. I first heard about Kibera Girls Soccer Academy, or KGSA, when I was teaching high school in Minnesota. I was so enthralled with the story that I decided I had to go by myself and sit and listen. I spent the summer of 2012 there in Kibera at KGSA, listening to the girls, to the teachers, and the administrators to see if I could figure out how and why the school was working so well. Kibera is the biggest slum in Kenya and the second biggest slum in all of Africa. It's about the size of Central Park in Manhattan. Its population is growing quickly, but because it's deemed an illegal settlement by the Kenyan government, the services are not. People living there lack things like clean running water, proper sanitation, and health care. People living in Kibera make on average between $1 to $5 a day. And because in Kenya, secondary education is not yet free, many kids living there drop out of school during primary, and girls feel pressure to get married and start having kids as soon as they start menstruating. What we're seeing in Kibera, we're seeing globally in slums all over the world. We know that in the developing world, every day, 10,000 girls are getting married before the age of 15. We know that in the developing world, half of our girls are mothers before the age of 18. And this is a problem. This is a problem because it's perpetuating the cycle of extreme poverty for the girls and their children. For the first time in the world, there are more people living in an urban setting than a rural setting. There's more people living further away from food. And we can see this as a crisis or as an opportunity. The people moving into these slums are intelligent. They're creative, they're hardworking. And we know that one thing for sure is working, offering girls access to education. We know that for every year a girl stays in school, her earning potential goes up 10 to 20%. We know that if a girl finishes high school, she is six times less likely to be a child bride. And giving girls education isn't just helping the girls, it's helping entire communities because we also know that girls and women are reinvesting 90% of their earnings back into their own families and into their own communities, transforming them from the inside out. So as a woman, as an educator, I understand the instinct to look at all of these stats and build as many schools for girls as quickly as possible. But I also think we need to ask how, and the people who have the answer to that are the girls who are living it themselves. Our model could be working better. In our old model, we have a tendency to equate school with the school building. It's easy to build a building. Donors love building buildings. It's a one-time expense. They can put their name on something tangible and then walk away. It's easy to build buildings, but it's much harder to fill those buildings with teachers who are getting paid a living wage and with kids who are healthy enough to continue to go to school. There are buildings all over the world. For example, in the region of Baltistan alone, Central Asia Institute built so many buildings that there are currently 18 ghost schools gathering dust. We need to stop focusing on buildings and start focusing on the people first. This is Abdul Qasim. He was born in Kibera and raised by his grandmother after his mother died when he was 10. She understood that education was his key to success. So, on the days that school fees were due, she would walk him to school to pay herself to make sure that he didn't squander the money on the way. And it worked. He graduated from secondary and went on to university. He studied telecommunications and got a job at a cell phone company. And he decided in his spare time that he wanted to give back what his grandmother gave to him by empowering the girls in Kibera. Now, he recognized that the boys weren't letting the girls onto the soccer pitch. So he decided to start a girls soccer team. He trained them and got them good, got them good enough that they could enter the boys tournaments and play against the boys. And at first they lost and they lost badly, five to nothing, four to nothing, but they kept at it. And then the day came when the girls beat the boys at soccer. And they realized that if they could beat the boys at soccer, they can do anything a boy can do. 
As the girls got older, they felt more and more pressure, and in 2005, Abdul lost all of his best strikers to pregnancy. When he asked them, he realized they weren't all having sex with their boyfriends. Some of them were having sex with men for money, to buy things like food and sanitary pads. When he asked how they could help, how he could help, they said that they wanted to go back to school, so he started one. Kibera Girls Soccer Academy started in one room. They had two tables, one textbook. He had to rent chairs with his cell phone salary. Now, today, six years later, it's a beautiful two-story building with four classrooms. They have a laboratory filled with chemicals and a library filled with books and computers with internet. But it didn't start there. It started with girls who wanted to learn and teachers who wanted to teach. Free school's not free. Just because a school doesn't charge tuition does not mean that girls in poverty can continue to go to school. Very few free schools have budget line items that support girls in extreme poverty, like transportation costs or medication costs. Because, Kib because Kibera has so many girls in extreme poverty, and because Abdul lives right next door to the school, he knows what these girls are up against. He took it one expense at a time. He got pushback from teachers who wanted to start charging tuition, and he said, no, our school has to be free. But that wasn't enough. So he worked to make sure that lunch was offered for free every single day. For some of these girls, it's the only meal that they get a day, but it makes a huge difference. Then the next step was to be able to provide the girls with free sanitary pads. And you know what? Their pregnancy cases dropped off immediately with these two needs covered. They haven't had a reported pregnancy since 2009. But that still wasn't enough. You see, it's extremely expensive for parents to send their girls to secondary school. It's one more mouth to feed. It's one less person bringing wages into the family. So the school started a microfinance program to support the parents to alleviate some of that stress so that they could get small loans for their small businesses. They also couple with an organization called Stitching for Life and give the most vulnerable parents, the single women who are HIV positive, jobs so that they can continue to support their girls to go to school. This is Lynette. Lynette was one of the first students at that school that had one room. Her dad died while she was in primary, and her mother died of malaria while she was going to KGSA. If she had been going to a free public school, she would have had to drop out at that point and start working to keep herself alive. But KGSA has students where about half of them are either orphans or not living with their families, so they've worked this into their budget as well. KGSA hired her brother to teach at the school, and help support their rent payments so she could continue to go to school, not just for four years, but for five. She wanted to go to college so badly and didn't score high enough the first time on her exams that she decided to repeat her fourth year. And on the second time, she did improve. And she's currently studying education in college and wants to be a teacher. Classroom performance is an easy, measurable outcome. Test scores are easy to look at, but it's more complicated than that, especially for girls in extreme poverty. UNESCO, for example, looks at almost exclusively intake and graduation rates to mark progress and outcomes. But graduation for a girl in extreme poverty isn't enough. There aren't enough spots for all of these girls in college, and if they don't make it, they need to get a job fast. They don't have a safety net. So of course, Kibera Girls Soccer Academy focuses on classroom performance, and they're getting better every year. Every year, they're sending more girls to college, which is really exciting. But they also look at the whole girl and look at her potential for earning wages after graduation. It started as a soccer team, and soccer continues to be important to the school along with other sports. When women play sports, they feel powerful. They know that they're agents of their own change. And it is a marketable skill. These girls are good. Some of the current students at KGSA are trying out for the Kenyan national team. In 2011, KGSA sent two of their students, Rose and Commando, to Paris, France, to play in the Homeless World Cup. Rose said that it was one of her dreams from the time she was a child to get on a plane, and that she couldn't sleep on the plane. She was so excited that there were movies that she could choose from right in front of her. 
The Kenyan women had never been to the Homeless World Cup before, and they did well. They made the finals, and Rose kicked the winning goal in the game against Mexico to win four to three and bring home the cup. But not all the students at KGSA are athletes, so they also take their after-school clubs very seriously. This is not just about recreation, but getting these girls marketable skills for after graduation. For example, their journalism club, they learn how to shoot pictures and video and edit them. They've started a small business that shoots weddings in Nairobi and brings money back into the school. The journalism club also teaches them how to write and edit, and they have an international magazine called Shutters because they're shedding light on what it means to be a young woman in Kibera. Because of that international magazine, a young man in California was able to work with his parents and World Reader for matching funds that just donated 100 ebooks to the school. And these are skills that the girls can use to market themselves after graduation and get jobs that are earning them higher wages. One of the UN Millennium Goals is working to offer free primary education to every kid around the world, which is amazing. One of the reactions to the school, however, there are organizations that go into primary school and try to identify the kids that show potential. They're pouring resources into those kids. And there's a couple of problems with this. For one, we're often using a very Western idea of what potential looks like. For another, often these organizations take those kids up and out of their community to take their talents elsewhere to affect a different community. And finally, what about the other kids? This isn't the model that KGSA uses. They're currently educating 130 girls every day, and they're looking for potential in every single one of them. And one of the coolest parts about the school is they don't define their community as just the students, but everyone who is a part of this school. This is Clarice, and Clarice was one of those kids that showed potential. She showed so much potential in primary school in Kibera that she got a sponsor to send her across the country and go to a boarding school in Kisumu to play soccer there. She did well on her exam and got into college, but not well enough to get a college scholarship. She couldn't pay, so she came back to Kibera looking for work so she could support her 14 siblings. Abdul hired her to teach math at KGSA even though she didn't have a college degree. Instead of going to Nairobi and finding college trained teachers, he takes people from within the community and puts them in front of the girls to say, look, you can do it too. But as the school expands, they want their teachers to be college trained. So instead of replacing Clarice with a college trained teacher, they're training her. She's going to night and weekend classes while she teaches at the school so she can become college trained. As her girls are looking at their teacher with pride, they're thinking, she can do it, and they're starting to believe that they can too. In our old philanthropic model, we give all the decision-making power to the people who have the money. So organizations like the Gates Foundation, or Columbia Earth Institute, or the World Bank, are making extremely important decisions about international education. When this happens, we're tinkering with a culture and a religion and a society that we don't always fully understand. KGSA, over the years, has accepted money from organizations in Kenya, in the UK, in Holland, France, and the United States to help financially support the school. The KGSA Foundation, in the United States, raises money for the school, but gives that money gladly to Abdul and his administrators and trusts that he will know what to do with it. And in turn, Abdul does what he's done from day one. He asks the girls what they need. What the girls say that they need now is a dormitory. They want Kabir Girls Soccer Academy to be a boarding school. And it's smart. They know that having a boarding school will mean more access to electricity and internet. It'll give them a safe place to study at night. They know that this will help their class performance. Plus, they see their classmates as their sisters and they want to live with their family. The land has been purchased and the renderings have been drawn, and soon Kibera Girls Soccer Academy will be a boarding school because that is what the girls deem necessary. Now, I'm not saying that we should replicate KGSA all over the world. I'm saying we need more models. We need models that are relevant in every single community. And the good news is that Abdul is not on his own. 
If you go into slums in countries like Ghana and China and India, you will find these small schools that are led by local leaders who understand the context and are effectively educating girls in extreme poverty and are waiting for our support. If given the resources, the girls know how to save themselves. It's just time that we start listening. Thank you.